Hi, Carrie. Hi, Jacob. So, how are you? I'm doing okay. I was really, really hoping that we could talk about a book tonight. Yeah, I was hoping that too. Uh, have Have you read any books recently? I have read one very special book um, called A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Langle. And I believe that is the book that we're going to discuss today. And I'm speaking about this as if this is not at all planned. Um, <laughs> but we talked about it this in the last episode that we were going to be reading A Wrinkle in Time. And here we are. Yeah, uh, it's a very short and quick to read book, 211 pages. It was published in 1963. Um, so if you want to go ahead and read it and then come back to this episode afterwards, then you should do that. But you can also listen to it if you haven't read it. Uh, and we'll try to be entertaining. I hope so anyway. Um, just before we get to it, I want to remind people that we do have a contest going on. If you send us lyrics uh, to a song, then I may record them and set them to music. And we may send you a book or a DVD uh you can find details elsewhere. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I really would. I really do hope that people enter this contest. I hope so too. Otherwise, I'm just going to enter a lot. Maybe I'll win. That would be great. <laughs> anyway. I encourage you to write more book. Write more books. <laughs> I encourage you to write more songs. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, and then uh, let's see. Uh, we haven't figured out what book we're going to do next episode yet. But um, I guess we'll figure that out in the later after we've talked about this one. I think we can do that. Excellent. Uh, well, let's get to it then, I guess. Cool. So we talked about A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Langle. Correct. And I did check on how it's pronounced. Yeah, I, I, I did too. I checked Wikipedia and Wikipedia uh, confirmed that it is Langle. Let me ask you something that is really not related to anything. Okay. So... I was I, I, okay. Based on the last episode discussion, I was confused as to whether Madeleine Langle was French or what. Uh, but I kind of thought that she was British and that this book was set in Britain, but it totally isn't. It's totally in America. It totally isn't. And I thought maybe she was British too. I think what made me think this was that my first exposure to A Wrinkle in Time was in my middle school library where um we all watched the film strip of a wrinkle in time ah. you know with the beep to advance and all of that fun stuff mm -hmm. and i think it was narrated by somebody british and so i just assumed it was a british book yeah i think it might be i don't know might be some of the names but it's also you know was written in the the 50s and 60s i think she she wrote it in the 50s, and it was published in 1960 or 1960-something. Um, so, I mean, it's older. Like, the, the kids in this book are now older than my mom by a lot. Sure. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's why the names are older. Like, you know, it's not a lot of kids named Charles Wallace. No. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, but actually that kind of brings uh, us to something that I wanted to talk about. Sorry, I'm kind of taking control of this one for some reason. No, it's reason. okay. You, you can do that. I'll let you. I'll, I'll interject when necessary. Okay. I have no shame. <laughs> yeah, that's why we love you. <laughs> one of many reasons. So, um, in our email back and forth, you mentioned that, you know, your childhood memories of the book were... Uh, you know, very, I think, fond or positive. Yes. And then rereading it, less so. But so what did you remember about the book from when you were a kid? You know, what I remembered about the book was time travel and, you know, kids going on a grand adventure. And that was super badass that they, you know, saved the world. Mm -hmm. And reading it as an adult, I'm like, well, first of all, they're not really time traveling. Um, they're saving their father, but not really the world. Yeah. And sure, it's a grand adventure, but they're constantly getting themselves, you know, captured, you know, half dead, mostly dead. Um, so their grand adventure is 
not one I would want to go on as an adult. Mm. <laughs> huh. So that's where I guess I remember magic and adventure and I read as an adult like no this is not good you don't you don't send kids to do this no oh man so it's like it's the haters light in terms of (laughs) but I'm on 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 this book I still liked it yeah I, I don't hate this book I I have I have some problems with it you know as a non-christian person you know reading this admittedly very very christian book is kind of like oh damn it's a little itchy like it's making me a little uncomfortable sometimes but yeah it's still good so um you know i was raised secularly uh you know kind of we celebrated christmas and stuff but we never went to church and there was never any talk of god or anything in in my house growing up um yeah and i mean my my mom, you know, did not raise me in any religion specifically, but we also celebrated um, Christmas and things like that. But it was ever, you know, with my mom and I, it was just kind of a, eh. Yeah, so when I read this book as a kid, I think um, most of the, the biblical stuff just sort of went over my head. And also... Like, it, it's not all biblical stuff. They, he, oh, no. they also quote Shakespeare and stuff like that. So I always... Uh, I always kind of thought of it as like, um, you know, one of the things I kind of took away from the book, I think, was that the universe is really complicated and difficult to understand and that some and that science and mathematics are like powerful tools in understanding the universe, but also sometimes kind of poetry or creative pursuits are a an even better way to really kind of get an idea of what's going on. So I didn't feel like I took that stuff totally literally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think you're onto something there. I mean, I think she is absolutely saying those things, but she, you know, as a writer is still, you know, writing it through the lens of, you know, a very religious woman who, who loves her faith and is writing a book with that filter. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned last time that I th- was under the impression that as the, as more books were added to the series, they became more kind of crazily Christian. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I don't really remember a lot about the later books, but I do remember reading many waters and thinking, well, this is, this is really weird. I don't really feel like this is in keeping with this series and that's Mm -hmm. the one that's about the twins and part of it is that they're sent back in time and ultimately help build Noah's Ark um and I was like wait but that's not (laughs) that's not a that's not a thing that's not a literally true thing that you could go back and do um hmm I wonder if we're gonna get in trouble for this episode I don't think we will I think you know our friends know us and they love us and anyone else who listens to it um yeah would know us and love us, um, and they've heard us talk about Dick Harm. So, well, that's true. Yes, if, if you if you made it, <laughs> if you made it through that. <laughs> if you made it through that last episode, then uh, you're probably not going to be put off too badly by our contention that Noah's Ark was not a real thing that happened in history. Um, yeah, so that I remember being a weird one. Okay, so but going back to this one, yes. Um, wh- what the fuck? Oh yeah. Well, that's what's great about it. It's so very what the fuck. Um, I'm so on board for this book. <laughs> Why don't you tell me a little bit about the fuck? Because I don't get it. I mean, I obviously I get the book. I'm you know I'm right. I'm not as as is often said in the book. I'm not a moron. <laughs> yeah, that that's something that hasn't aged altogether well. I don't feel like people call each other morons in that way no and they especially like don't call kids morons like oh man i thought you were a moron turns out you can talk what the fuck yeah i and i feel like i mean like her point her larger point is that um people you know people who other who society might think are morons aren't actually they're they may be really smart they may have their you know gifts 
of their own. They may be good at some things and bad at other things, but they aren't actually stupid. Or they may just not want to talk to you. Yeah, that's also true. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that term just kind of jumps out at you. But in terms of what the fuck. Yes, tell me about uh, the fuck. <laughs> so there's a family, uh, the Murrays. Um, the father has been missing for some years and is apparently on some kind of government uh, related uh, enterprise that means that he's not at home and also can't correspond with them. Um, and it seems like no one knows where he is. The mother is therefore raising the kids, which there's four of them. Sandy and Dennis, the twins, are 10 and they're kind of boring and are, we don't really pay any attention to them. Charles Wallace is five years old and didn't start talking until he was four, I think, mm -hmm. uh, but is basically a genius to a level where he is kind of barely human. I think so, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's at least alluded to a lot that he's not... He's not... He's very special in a different way. Right. Like, he and... He refers to himself as a sport. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the basically the point of view character Meg uh, who's 13 years old and who thinks that she's stupid but is really good at math um, and so she ends up being basically being the hero of the story so Charles Wallace um, runs into these three creatures slash women slash witches named Mrs. What's It Mrs. Who and Mrs. Witch. What are they? Um, they're spiritual guides. Yes, that's right. They're angels. They're um, horse ladies. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're a lot of things, but they are... X-stars. X-stars. They are their guides to these children. Mrs. Witch is basically a ghost, it seems like. Yeah, every once in a while she fades in and out. Um, whatever. You do your thing. <laughs> That didn't impress you, huh? No, I would think that the older you get, the more you know honed your your skills are. But it turns out the older you get, the more you you can't materialize. I was like, really? Whatever. That's stupid. I think it might be more that you just the more you don't want to be bothered. No, oh, okay. But I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I'll, I'll believe you because you know you're better at math than I am. <laughs> Um, anyway, so anyway, so they get whisked away on this journey, um, that takes them across galaxies and different planets. And ultimately they go to this world called Kamazots, which I looked up on Wikipedia. What would you guess what it means? Um, fuck, I don't know. The opposite of Camelot. <laughs> It means death bat. Death bat is so badass. Yeah, in in is, is there uh, a metal band called Death Bat? Because if if there isn't, there should be. That is amazing. Yeah, so it's uh, in a Native American language that I'm not going to try to pronounce, but it says uh, that it was associated with night, death, and sacrifice. Cool, cool. And there's a lot of things. The next planet they go to with the uh, the friendly blind tentacle creatures mm -hmm. is. Uh, I X C H E L, and that's yeah. I know that that is a Native American word because I, I looked that one up. Right, that's a Mayan goddess, the aged jaguar goddess of midwifery and medicine. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's all this Native American stuff too. This book is has like a lot of everything. Yeah. So right, so they end up on Camazots, uh, where Meg's father is being kept prisoner. And they try to rescue him. Yes. And initially they succeed in rescuing him, but Charles Wallace is left behind and is captured by IT, which is a giant brain. Yeah. And um, one thing that I, I, I thought was really fun and sort of fascinating about this planet is that everybody moves in sync. Everyone does the same thing at the same time. And those who do not are tortured until they do. Right. So what do you think that that's about? Why are you making me do all this work? I don't know. I'm being a jerk. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's just, you know, just 
be your own person because if if you just you know blindly follow, you're not going to be happy or fulfilled. And if you step out of place, you're going to get you know you're going to get tortured. But nobody in this planet is happy. Well, right. I mean, there's a few things that I think about, like within the book itself, Meg and Charles and to a lesser extent, maybe Calvin are all kind of tortured for not fitting in, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, Meg in particular seems to be miserable a lot of the time, partly because her dad is gone, but also just partly because... Because she's a moron. Right, exactly. (laughs) Because she's a moron. (laughs) (laughs) Just like you and me. Yeah, just like us. Um, Yeah, I mean... Okay, I, I get where you're going with this. Continue, continue. But then also, I feel like, um, you know, in the larger world of the early 60s, there's communism, right? That's like one example of sort of conformism gone wild. Mm-hmm. And everyone is supposed to contribute to the state in exactly the same way. And if they don't, they get taken off to the gulag. You know, and this is, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm talking in this way but i mean that's literally you know people were killed but then also in the united states like in the 50s there's you know people start fleeing to the suburbs where all the houses you know to these developments where all the houses are exactly the same there's that song uh, little boxes and the children go to summer camp and then to the university where they are put in boxes and they come out all the same. And so, like, that's kind of the flip side of communism. And both of those are kind of conformism. And I think that you could, as a, you know, read, as a reader at the time or now, you could read this as a critique or a reference to either or both of those. And I think it's intended as a critique, you know, as a commentary on both of those. But the fact that the house is, you know, it's really like a tract. I think they even say that it reminds them of, like, one of these suburban tracks Mm -hmm. where all the houses are the same. So I think maybe it's more of more pointy pointed at that, but um, it sort of reminded me of invasion of the body snatchers in that way. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and the fact that there was one kid whose ball bounced differently and all of a sudden it was just like, Oh crap. Yeah. (laughs) Like every head turns at the same time you know something bad's going to happen. I mean, it's super creepy, and that's why I really, really enjoyed this town, just because it was, like, the first time I absolutely felt like, oh, these kids are fucked. Yeah. And they they kind of are. (laughs) Like, it doesn't go super well. Yeah, I mean, you know, these three kids that they don't look anything like anybody in the town, they're obviously, you know, not doing what everyone else is doing at the same time that everyone else is doing it, and it is very noticed. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Something's going to go down. And something really does go down. Um, they meet the man with the, the red eyes yeah. who hypnotizes, uh, for lack of a better word, um, Charles Wallace. And um, the other two flee. Um, no, then Charles Wallace takes them to the father they get the father and then they flee. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, oh, then they see it. There's a lot of shit that happens in a very short amount of time. Then, yeah, and then they see the brain and then they flee. Right. Um, but Charles Wallace is left behind and uh, Meg has to go back and get him. Yes. And rescues it. Like, the way that she defeats it, basically, is by concentrating on how much she loves Charles Wallace. Mm-hmm. Which seems kind of cliched in a way but it didn't bother me no i mean when when they said that only she could do it i was like with the power of love <laughs> and i was i was right you were right good job but yeah i mean it is it is cliched but i mean for this book it made sense because it, it was either she's going to defeat it with you know bible verses or she's going to defeat it with the power of love and bible verses probably wouldn't work because there's you know a pattern and a rhythm to it that could easily fall into its you know pulsating beat oh you know what i liked i liked that one of the things before you know before the the whole love situation one of the things that works best is the declaration of independence (laughs) i thought that was kind of great well i guess if you're gonna remember anything it's gonna be the declaration of independence right and that's uh it says hey everyone's equal on camazots 
and and Meg's like, no, everyone's the same. It's not the same thing. Yeah. And then they get transported back to Earth kind of unceremoniously. And uh, that's basically the end of the book. Can I talk about my favorite character in the book? Please do. Aunt Beast. I love Aunt Beast. It's a great name for a great character. I know. And, and I guess this goes with um, the, the the goddess that the planet is named after, um, who was uh, the goddess of what again? Let's see. The aged jaguar goddess of midwifery and medicine. Okay. So this... Planet is named after the goddess of midwifery and medicine, and that is sort of what they do for Meg, or what Aunt Beast does for Meg. Um, Meg is pretty fucking close to death um, after um, Charles Wallace is left behind under the influence of it. She has to go through the bad stuff. I forget what the hell, the black thing which is the dark cloud or evil or Satan or whatever that covers some planets, um, including um, Tamazots. Yeah. And so she has to go through it, and she's frozen solid. She can't move. She's mostly dead. And um, Aunt Beast cradles her and nurses her back to life. Um, And then finally you know, feeds her amazing foods and they have, you know, conversations about what it is to see uh, because um, she is a sightless beast um, who has four arms and a lot of tentacles and and soft, uh, wonderful fur. And uh, I loved her. I thought she was awesome. I was like, that's the aunt that I want and need. Yeah, that's great. Like one of the things that I like, about the book is just kind of the inventiveness of it that you've got a you know someone like that um the blind tentacled forearm beast that also nurses people back to health and is apparently incredibly intelligent and um kind you've got a two-dimensional planet which i that made me a big impression on me when I was a kid. I still remembered that. Mm. There's so there's a planet where they go to and they almost get squashed flat because it only has two dimensions. There's yeah, there's the planet where um I guess Mrs. What's it lives with the weird centaur pegasus angel hybrid thing. <laughs> thing which is really the only way to describe it. Um and everyone and everyone sings um hymns. Right. And then the you know, kind of the the antagonist or the evil enemy is never re- necessarily con- confronted directly exactly, but it's that dark shadow that they just call the dark thing, which I appreciated for its non-specificness. And then I just, I liked Meg. I liked, mm-hmm. I, I, I really, uh, I think as a kid, I um, identified with her mm-hmm. quite a bit as like this kind of dorky kid with glasses who was good at math but not so great at getting along with people um all the time Mm -hmm. and i think it's great that she's the heroine um you know there are a lot of attitudes in these books which i don't think i got from the book Mm -hmm. uh necessarily but which i i think was reinforced by it maybe just like the the idea that your flaws can also be strengths. Yeah, I mean, that was the gift that she was given in order to fight these, you know, these horrors was your flaws. Yeah. I was like, badass. Yeah. And, and, for, and of course, you know, her, her flawed self is like, what the fuck? Really? How's that going to come in handy? Oh, but it does. Yep. And then also just being from this kind of weird family, which I guess everyone thinks their family is weird, but, uh, you know, like the mother cooks stew in a beaker on a Bunsen burner. (laughs) Uh, They have a dog named Fortin Pross. I think that's one of the reasons why I thought it was set in England. Um, and then this, just this kind of idea that, uh, people develop at different rates and they have different skills and things and that's fine Mm -hmm. that uh doesn't make one person better than another that's something that i really do believe very strongly and it's something that's a theme of the book 
Um, yeah, so, yeah, so this was definitely an important book to me when I was a kid. Yeah. Oh, we didn't really, well, whatever, we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I was just remembering, like, how, you know, when I read it, one of the things, started reading it, one of the things that kind of won me over early on is, like, that Meg is worried about the, like, that, that's apparently there's been this tramp that stole someone's sheets. <laughs> and then <laughs> when... Mrs. What's it shows up. Uh, Charles Wallace is like, I think you should have consulted me before you stole those sheets. <laughs> yeah, the sheet stealing was a really big deal in their town. Yeah, like it was a huge scandal, and they were like, we thought maybe we needed to be ghosts. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, y'all are crazy. I love that. Yeah, and that's when I sort of realized that like they were they were good people. Like they were going to be good characters because they're like. Well, if we're going to live in a haunted house, we thought maybe we might need some sheets. Yeah. That's okay. Okay. It's not going to turn out where, you know, at the end of the book, they're going to turn on you. Nah, they're solid. Yep. Um, and then the whole Tesseract thing. And that's what I wanted to talk about next. Sure. Good. <laughs> so, let's talk some science here. Okay. Talk to me about the Tesseract. Or the, the, the act of tessering in this, um, which seems to be very different because they tesser and there's that. Yeah, so explain it. Explain it uh, in, a, in, a, in a fun and slightly understandable way. Oh, my God. That's a tall order. <laughs> I'm not going to do it as well as Madeline Lankel did. Uh, but a tesseract is a four-dimensional cube, basically. Um you know, like as a line is to a square or a square is to a cube, a cube is to a tesseract. Um, okay. So it's a, te it's a, it's a cube on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> right. Again, not good at math. <laughs> Need to dumb this down a little bit. And um, Mrs. Who correct she she explains yes. the tesseract mm -hmm. to meg um and meg takes a long time to get it yeah would you like to uh, um go with that sure tell me a little more okay well so <laughs> we're talking about more than three dimensions so in addition to like length width height there's some other direction with a name that we don't you know have in english because we only have three dimensions here on planet earth um yeah but you know the idea is like let's say that you've got you know if you have a square yep. if you're confined to the square and you want to get from one corner to another then you just have to walk along the diagonal and it takes a long time but if you aren't confined to the square you know the square could be folded up or you know, are bent like the the image that's used in the book is that you have a piece of fabric and then you move the two sides of it together. So the ant can cross. Right. So you know, if you're an ant that can only walk on the fabric, you still have to walk the same different distance. But if you can get off the fabric just a little bit, then you just hop right over, and it takes no time at all. Mm -hmm. So it's a higher dimensional version of that. Um, where, you know, you're on this cube or in s some kind of structure in space and you want to get from one pa place to another. And if you have to stay in those three dimensions, then it'll take a long time. But if you have access to the next dimension, then maybe you can fold things and get from one to the other very quickly. Kind of a space warp or a warp drive kind of situation, I guess. Yes. Okay. Do I pass? I think you pass. I am not a good grader of these things, so yeah, you to you you totally pass. Um, awesome. <laughs> well, I'm just happy that you're not uh, grading me on the dick harm scale. <laughs> on a scale of one to penis murder, I oh think you God. did okay. All right. Um. So, are they traveling through time? Yes. How do you know? That they are traveling through time because they said early on that they were going to arrange things so that they would get back five minutes after they left okay fine um <laughs> i completely <laughs> forgot about i'm like i know that they ended up 
back there. But I just sort of figured, I don't know, maybe other planets have time run differently. I don't fucking know these things. So, okay, so they do travel through time. So I was like, okay, the book is called A Wrinkle, Through, A Wrinkle in Time. Where the fuck is the time? Yeah, I they know. They just seem to be jumping from place to place, and the whole time concept only comes to play at the very, very end when they're like, oh, here we are. We're back home again. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it's, you know, I guess it's just a play on a stitch in time. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I agree. Like, the traveling seems to be through space. Um, I don't know. What are you going to do? I don't know. I call up Madeline, um, who's very dead, uh, Lingle, and say, fix this? Yes. <sighs> this classic this classic w- work of children's literature i don't like this title we need to punch um, up the title yeah i, I still want to say you know i i have i have issue with i have issue with so many things i hate ever i hate everything and every oh yeah I, I just hate a lot of things sure um and so even though i've said a lot of negative things about this book i really enjoyed it because you know it was so different even though you know, the idea of traveling through space and the idea of, you know, obviously as a, a voracious reader of YA, the idea of kids saving the day or teenagers saving the day is like hardly a novel concept. I think this book does it so well. And and the characters are so ordinary in their, you know, in their flaws, in their appearance in in their their weirdness yeah um that even though they're brilliant um and special they're also it could be any reader ever you know that's why i think you felt such a connection to it i'm not saying you're a weirdo oh i i am (laughs) i'm saying it was a possibility (laughs) um and i think that's what you know draws people to it is that you feel like it's not written about someone who's not you. You know, when you read a lot of YA, the person is always beautiful but clumsy or chosen but beautiful and beautiful and beautiful and beautiful. But there's never anyone who's just like, yeah, she was a little fucked up. Or, you know what, this dude was weird or this, you know, they weren't. Yeah, and so I I thought that was really special. And the... One more thing that I completely forgot that I thought was an odd thing in the book. Yes. And, and it was about um, Calvin, who we actually didn't speak about, about very much. But he was, you know, the friend who also maybe has some psychic powers. Um, yeah. He was a year older than Meg, but he was like four grades ahead of her. Uh, yeah, he's in 11th grade. I'm not sure. Yeah, he's 14 in 11th grade. And I was like, you say you're not special, but there was some obvious skippage going on. Yeah, I think, right. I think his uh, his explanation of that consisted of two words, which was, I'm bright. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, yes, Calvin. But yes, I was like... It took me a while to realize that there actually wasn't a lot of age difference between he and Meg. Because I was like, what's a 17-year-old kid doing, like, macking on a 13-year-old? Like, whoa. Yeah. But they were only a year apart, even though they were many grades apart. Yes. So, that was something I was just like, they don't even talk about this, really. But, yeah, he does say he's bright. um, But they don't really mention, like, oh, by the way really bright yeah i'm i i agree um i think that i feel like it's significant that charles wallace is like the really exceptional one but he's not the hero of the story meg is the one who saves the day Mm -hmm. Um, i think if he had been the one that saves saved the day the book wouldn't be nearly as relatable and i don't think it would be nearly as popular because who wants to read about a five-year-old kid who who can save the world right um i guess orson scott card fans but that's about uh, it. <laughs> we're never reading anything by Orson Scott Card. I hate that man with the passion of seven running suns colliding into a giant supernova. Hate. Understood. Respected. Agreed. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I liked the book. You know, again, 
problems with it, but they're 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 minor in comparison to the you know the fun of this book. Like the book is actually really fun to read. It's a quick book. Um, you know, I, I read it on my Kindle, and you know, oh, fifteen minutes later, I'm twenty five percent of the way through the book. Holy crap! Yeah, it is nice that it's so short. <laughs> Uh, so, so there's a classic work of literature that, um, we both more or less like. I would, yeah, I, I think, I think we both, we, we both liked it more than less. Yes. So, uh, in terms of what we're going to read next time, this is something we haven't really talked about at all. Okay. Uh, or I mean, we, I, we haven't talked about what we're going to read next. I don't think. <laughs> I don't um, think we have, but let, let's let's discuss. What are we reading next, Jacob? Well, I feel like it's been a little while since we read a book that you just loved. <gasps> Uh-oh. And I feel kind of bad about that. What are we going to read? So, well, I've got a few ideas, and let, we can see which ones you find most appealing. Oh. All right. So one idea was... Um, Vivian Apple at the End of the World. Have you read that one yet? I haven't read it yet. That one, uh, I... Th- I liked, but thought it could have been executed better, but Mm -hmm. I seem to be in the minority on that. Most people seem to love it. Okay. And it, that one I described to you as basically left behind for atheists. I love this concept. The next one is one that I think (laughs) a bunch of people I know would like us to do, which is, uh, boys don't knit. By T.S. Easton. I'm willing to. I'm willing to uh, to do a a reader recommendation here or a, a listener recommendation. I'm, I'm yeah I'm open to that, even though the the title is probably <laughs> one of the worst I've ever heard. Well, right, you understand the appeal to uh, oh yeah say me. Um, and then the third one I was thinking of, which may be in the winner, is Lola and the Boy Next Door. <gasps> You know how much I love Lola and the Boy Next Door. I uh, I have an idea, but I don't know that we've spoken of it specifically. Well, we know how much I love Anne and the French Kiss. That might, that I do know. I might like Lola more. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Okay, so let's do that one, and I think we will do the we'll do the other two at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, we're gonna do we're gonna do <laughs> Lola and the Boy Next Door. I love that book so much. Yay! Yeah, I. So there are. There are three books. There's Anna and the French Kiss, Lola and the Boy Next Door, and Isla and the Happily Ever After. Yeah. They're all three sort of sappy, sort of lovey-dovey books. Like, no joke. They're they're romantical YA books. Yeah. But they're really well done, and I am not a sappy romantical person. I think we can all, like, agree that I, again, I hate everyone and everything, <laughs> Um but I love these books, and I love Lola and the Boy Next Door. All right, I haven't read it yet, so I'm looking <gasps> forward to that. I have a feeling you're gonna really like this book, and I I think after we do Lola, yeah, let's do that knitting book. Yeah, I, I agree. Because we've done a couple of like, you know, the what was our last book? Oh, it was um the Haters, and then it was this book. Um, yeah, so I think if we keep it sort of fun. For a couple episodes, and then maybe after that, we read Amber Spyglass. Oh, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I think that could be a possibility, because then we sort of, you know, we get to see old friends again. Yeah. I like it. Okay, we have a plan. I love having a plan. All right. So, so I've, I've heard I've heard a, 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 a rumor. Yes. That there's a contest. Oh, yeah, yeah, there totally is. How are we doing with this contest, Jacob? Uh, well, let me count. Uh, how many entries we've received? Oh so my god! Far. Entries like more than one? Uh, zero. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, um... y'all, <laughs> do you want a Southern New England girl to admonish you? Because there's a book on the line here, a really, really good bad book. Yeah. For you. It's really excellent. In a terrible way, or vice yeah. versa. And then there's a movie which is terrible in a terrible way. Yeah. So, um, in the last episode, uh, we answered some questions about it, but it occurred to me that I I know that there are people who don't listen to episodes until they've read the book. Mm-hmm. So I think I might edit that 
part into its own little mini episode and put that out in the feed okay. just so that people will hear it and know what's going on and maybe that will help but uh, sure hope so because you know I am just super really 100% amazingly excited about this um mostly because I want to see what weird shit y'all come up with and I want Jake to record it very badly me too but do you know what we did get? What did we get? We got some listener mail. Yay! Who did we get listener mail from? Sarah Redacted. Sarah Redacted. What is your question? Well, this is a very short uh, message. Sarah Redacted writes, I do not understand the dick harm scale, and I find it very unsettling. Nobody understands the dick harm scale, <laughs> and I think it's supposed to be unsettling. It is dick harm. Yes. Uh it's true. I don't think that we explained it very well, and I think that's because neither of us really understood how it worked either, which didn't prevent us from using it. Yeah, I think in the book, um, they talked about dick harm just randomly, like, oh, I was so embarrassed, my dick ran away. Um, but it was a lot more elaborate than that. <laughs> and, and, and so we ran with it. I found... Th- the excerpt from the book where they explain it more or less do tell okay so here's the quote basically the idea is if something is really great we get so amped that we have no choice but to do harm to our own dicks that is the true measure of how wonderful a thing can be then skipping a bit it is important to note that dick harm also happens when something is terrible But usually when things are terrible, it's less you harming your dick and more your dick just trying to flee the situation at all costs. So there's all kinds of nuance to dick harm that we've been developing over the years. So I don't know if that helps, uh, but that's basically what that scale was based on. Um, (laughs) I mean, our, our version is, of course, you know, not as nuanced as, you know, a couple of teenage boys who have been, you know, honing this, um, scale for, for years. Um, but I think it is supposed to be a little unsettling and we were just, I don't know, punch drunk. It was funny (laughs) to us, sort of. It was, I, I haven't heard back. I haven't heard back from my mother about it. I'm yet. not surprised. I think I'm off the Christmas card list. <laughs> I was never, I was never on the Christmas card list, y'all. But I'm definitely not on it now. All <laughs> uh, right. So um, I guess that's. I think that's. Let's see. Oh, so there's. In the last episode, I mentioned that there's a secret Facebook group, and I feel like that secret Facebook group is. Uh, be, being pretty cool i think so too there's been some good discussions there like, yeah we've actually had like conversations about what people have been reading that's not you know ya or is ya and you know it's 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 nice to sort of have a, a relaxing space to not necessarily talk about the podcast but also totally talk about the podcast yeah and uh people talked about grasshopper jungle and that was fun that was such a weird book i'm, yeah. I'm getting punch drunk too now i'm sorry i'm okay. gonna, gonna start singing uh, and dancing okay well you know what carrie i always love talking to you and i love you like crazy i love you like crazy mrs what's it has a bunch of ugly sweaters mrs what's it likes to eat caviar Mrs. What's It is sort of a flying centaur. Mrs. What's It used to be a star. Mrs. What's It wears at least a dozen scarves. She's got black rubber boots on her feet. Mrs. What's It is 2.4 billion years old. Mrs. What's It stole my sheets. So give me my sheets back, you thieving angel. Return my sheets right away. You can travel through time, so what's the holdup? Return them without delay. Give me my sheets back, you wretched angel. Return my sheets right away. You can travel through time, so what's the holdup? I want them back yesterday. Return them yesterday. Love, why, like crazy.com.